Well, good morning, Selby Pastoral Charge, and welcome to this time of worship for September 26, 2021. Today is yet another opportunity for us to celebrate. We're celebrating some new members, the power of music to touch our hearts and our minds. And we're also celebrating that we are, in fact, better together. The Apostle Peter says, above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And so, let us gather ourselves together in love. Let us worship God's love. Let us be healed by that love personified that we might be who we were truly made to be. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. Let's gather ourselves together in song. What does it mean to belong? That's what we were thinking about last week, wasn't it? That's one of the most fundamental questions that we can seek to answer in, our, in ourselves. Well, one way to answer that question is to find a place where our wounds and our worries, our failures and our fears do not define us. And this is a place where all of that is secondary to your true identity as a child of God who bears the image of your creator. This is who you truly are. And in light of this fact, we come before God knowing that he sees us, that he knows us, that he accepts us. So let us come into God's presence in prayer. Let's pray together. O God, who calms our storms, heals our hearts, and restores our souls. As we worship together today, help us to move past our fear, open our hearts knowing that in you we are nothing to be afraid of, open our minds to your possibilities, and begin your work in us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
For so many months, we have enjoyed the musical talents of so many of our, of our members, and occasionally we've had a musical guest. Well, this week, we had a musical guest stop by our pastoral charge, a, a friend of Ed and Bernice's for more than 40 years, Esther Kolpitz, who, who sung here several years ago, uh, but she is a wonderful singer and songwriter. She sang a bunch of songs for us, so we will include those in services over the coming months. But let's listen as she touches our hearts this morning with a song called Spirit Wings. Some birds live in cages, they sing a quiet song, like them I could sing only you. Lord, your love released me to sing a different song. Soar above the captive life I knew. Spirit wings, you lift me over all the earthbound things. Like a bird, my heart is flying free. I'm soaring on the song. Amazing. I said this morning was a morning of celebration, and it's time to celebrate as we welcome seven new members into our congregation. So I'm going to invite those folks to start to make their way forward and to gather here in the front row, and, uh, and we will welcome some new members into our church. The church is a community of people with varied gifts, united by the Holy Spirit. We gather to celebrate God's presence, to discern God's truth, and to follow in the way of Jesus. By our baptism, we are made members of Christ's church. We exercise this membership in the denomination to which we belong, which for us is the United Church of Canada, and within the context of a local community of faith. On behalf of Selby United Church, I present Jim Jarman, Judy Jarman, Louise McKee, Carol Miller, Cassie Putman, David Putman, and Louise Story, who are joining our congregation by either a transfer, membership, or profession of faith. By way of introduction, although none of these folks are complete strangers in our community or in our midst, they come to us from different places and with different faith backgrounds. Jim and Judy 
have been active part participants in this faith community for a few years, transferring their membership from Roblin United Church. Jim and Judy have many connections in this community, and we are grateful for their presence here amongst us. Louise, was a, uh, Louise McKee was a member of Trinity United Church at, at one time, and we are so grateful for her witness of music and word in our midst. Louise's faith, tested by the challenges of life, is a, a testament to the goodness of God and God's plan for her. We look forward to her friendship and ministry with us. Carol Miller grew up in, uh, in Selby for a time. She even attended Selby Church School uh, as a youth. We are so blessed that through our online services, God has once again brought her back to Selby United Church, and we look forward to getting to know her in this beloved community. David and Kathy Putnam recently moved from Ancaster, Ontario to Belleville, Ontario. Both Kathy and David were active participants in their home church, Marshall Memorial United Church in Ancaster, and we are blessed by their presence here as they make this their spiritual home. Louise Story is certainly no stranger in our midst. In such a short time, Louise has made a significant impact on our outreach ministry leading the Blessing Bag Project last Christmas, as well as numerous other outreach initiatives to the Village Green Nursing Home and even leading worship on a couple of occasions. And we are truly blessed by her many, 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 many gifts. And so, Jim, Judy, Louise, Carol, Catherine, David, and Louise, you have made it known, made you known your intention to be full members of Selby United Church. So by way of confirming your faith, I will ask you these questions. Do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? If so, answer, I do by the grace of God. Desiring the freedom of new life in Christ, do you seek to resist evil and to live in love and justice? If so, answer, I will, God being my helper. Will you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as Savior and Lord? If so, answer, I will, God being my helper. Will you join with your brothers and sisters in this congregation to share in the life, work, and ministry of Jesus Christ? If so, answer, I will, God being my helper. Congregation, let us pledge our support and care to these new sisters and brothers in faith. Will you stand as you are able? As your brothers, in, oh, we read together, we read together. As your brothers and sisters in Christ, we rejoice in the gifts you bring us. We pledge to you our love and our support. With God's help, we will together live out the mission and ministry of Christ Church. You may be seated. All that is required to become a full member of this church is to profess your faith. But we do not make this profession alone, but we do this as a body, as the body of Christ. And so let us join together in reading the United Church Creed together. We believe in God who has created... Oh, <laughs> that's not right. Let's read what's actually on the screen. <laughs> we are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is created who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Jim, Judy, Louise, Carol, Catherine, David, and Louise, in the name of Jesus Christ, the only head of the church, we welcome you to the privileges and responsibilities of membership in this place, and we give thanks to God for your witness among us. Tim's now going to present the certificates of your membership. And as we do that, 
I'm going to invite us to sing halle, halle, hallelujah as we celebrate this moment. And I'm also going to invite the kids to come and join us here in the front pews as these folks uh, begin to take their seats. So let's sing and let's celebrate together. Boy, it is so good to see each and every one of you guys here today. We missed a couple of you last week, but I'm sure glad you're back this week. And we're always blessed when you guys are with us because we are a family together. And that's what we've been talking about over the last few weeks is how we are better together. Now, back, back before we got back in the same space together, I would often go off to an interesting place, right? And I would record my services there. And then we could watch it at home on Sunday mornings, right? Well, I'm going to keep experimenting with that a little bit as we head over these, uh, these few months and, and try to figure out a way to keep bringing that beauty and those significant places uh, into our worship. And so today, I want to share a time that I pre-recorded. I went out to a forest, and I recorded a special message for you guys. So let's watch that message. Well, hey, guys. As you can see, I'm in a forest, and this majestic pine forest provides a beautiful place to hike and to ride a bike in the summer and to ski and snowshoe in the winter. But when you look at a forest like this one, you might just assume that it's a collection of unrelated trees and shrubs and small animals. And that's what's surprising about forests. In recent years, scientists have discovered that these trees are actually a kind of community. Did you know that trees can actually talk to one another? They can work together and they actually sacrifice themselves for their communal flourishing. But you know what? Maybe that's not so surprising because the Bible teaches us that community is what God created the world for. Have you ever wondered about that? Why did God create this beautiful world for us? Well, we Christians believe that God is three persons. God is our Heavenly Father. God is the Son, who is Jesus and God is the Holy Spirit. And that means that God is community within God's self. So we believe that God created the world to share God's perfect love with his creation. And after he had created the world, he made a person, but not just one person, but he made many persons. Why did he do that? To create community where God's love could be shared farther and farther and wider and wider. What we're learning now as biologists study trees and forests and other animals is that God not only made us for community, but he made everything for community. Under the ground is a fo in this forest is a vast array of complex systems of roots. Baby trees attach themselves to their parents' roots, and over time, other trees join together to provide one another with nutrients and water and even to combat pests. Trees form pathways and arteries, sharing resources and helping to care for the weaker members in their community. And just like these trees, we have all been made to live depending on others. And that's why God created the church for us. This is a place that we can grow together with all of our differences to make one another stronger. And that's a wonderful thing indeed. All right, let's sing a hymn for, uh, for the young at heart. And at the end of it, you young people are going to head out for Sunday school. So let's sing together. Act justly.
Well, today is the fourth week of our sermon series called Better Together. And this week we're thinking about how Jesus withdraws from his community to be in the Garden of Gethsemane to pray before his arrest and trial. As we listen to this passage, I want you to notice who Jesus brings along for this time of being away. They aren't perfect helpers on this occasion, but even so, Jesus knows that he is better together. This morning, the word of God comes to us through the voice of Elena. Today I am reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verses 32 to 41. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that, if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, yet everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he asked, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Can you fall, can you keep? Watch for one hour, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thanks to Elena. We look forward to seeing Elena hopefully at Cornerstone this week as we begin back with our our kids group. Let's pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come so that we might hear what you have for us today. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I suspect it's completely normal to have a fear of the dark. Even if we mostly outgrow it at some point, we all know that the dark is the place where unknown possibilities lurk. When I was a kid, that place for me was my parents' basement. Uh, During the daytime, it was just a concrete space filled with Christmas decorations and and tools and, uh, and camping gear. But at night, it became a space akin to a haunted house. It was the place that any number of spooky things could suddenly seem possible, and the worst scenario was to find yourself there alone in the dark. The other day, my son Max reminded me of one of my own parenting missteps. Back when he was a little younger, we used to store his Christmas presents in the back room in the basement. Hidden underneath a blanket beside the furnace, we figured that was a place he would never go on his own. What I didn't account for was that he'd feel perfectly comfortable in that scariest room in the house if someone else was in the basement with him. When I assumed that he was playing nicely in his play space in the basement and I was busy working on a project of my own, he was actually discovering all the gifts that he was getting from Santa that year. In a moment of parenting weakness, I told him that he shouldn't really go into that back room because that's where the monsters live. I suspect he'll be working out that parenting misstep uh, with his counselor down the road. But we all live with certain fears, and they come in all shapes and sizes. Our fears sometimes reflect our regrets from the past, the party we wish we never went to, the job we wish we'd never taken, the words we wish we'd never said, their impact, still a tender spot that wakes us up in the middle of the night when we're not even thinking about it. The problem with our fears is they often trick us into thinking that no one else has ever gone through what I'm going through. We we start to imagine that, uh, that no one could possibly feel what I'm feeling. 
So we decide to go it alone. And that's mistake number one. Because in the dark, alone, the tendency is to do one of two things, rationalized or catastrophize. I might say, it's no big deal. I can do this on my own. How bad could it possibly be? I'll just hope it goes away. Or I might go the other way and see trouble behind every bush. We start to think that the whole world is against us and, the only, and only we can really trust ourselves. So either way, rationalize or catastrophize, we're heading down that road alone. And that's why I've chosen for this week our text where Jesus goes to Gethsemane to pray. It's a text normally reserved for Holy Thursday, a day in the church calendar that mostly gets overlooked. But today, as we continue to think about the ways in which God has made us to be better together, Jesus offers us a helpful model as he faces his own greatest fears. We often think of Jesus' time in the garden on that night before his death as a kind of solo venture. We might read it as a tribute to his willingness to face his task with stoic determination. But when we do, we're actually not really being faithful to the text. Yes, Jesus withdrew from the hubbub of the Last Supper, but he didn't do it alone. He invited three of his group to join him. And we need to keep in mind that this is Jesus that we're talking about here. If anybody could have done it alone, it was him. Jesus knows full well what's about to happen. He's told his disciples what's going to happen. He's going to be betrayed. He's going to be denied. He's going to be tortured to death. He had every reason to want to be away for a while. But even so, he takes three of his disciples to support him in his time of agony. Can you imagine? They've just finished this rather interesting dinner. Jesus washed their feet as if he was their servant. He talked about his upcoming death as a, a necessary part of God's redemptive plan. He invited them to eat his flesh and to drink his blood as if that's just a thing that we do. And as if that all wasn't awkward enough, he reveals that one is going to betray him and another is going to deny him. If you think you've sat through a few awkward family dinners, this one takes the cake. But the evening's not over. I don't know about you, but when I have something big coming up the next day, the last thing on my mind is to be with a group. I've got a big service coming up or, or a procedure uh, or, or uh, I'm just, uh, just feeling the pressure of the week. The, my inclination is to retreat away, to go to bed early, to, to try to keep my mind on something else. But not Jesus. If anyone had a reason to look everyone in the eye and say, no one understands what I am going through, it's Jesus. But Jesus modeled another way. We would understand if he kept his thoughts to himself. But he chose to bring others into his struggle. One of the amazing things about a church family, when we're at our best, and let's be honest, we haven't been at our best <laughs> for the last year and a half, but I believe we're, we're heading back there, is that we're never alone in our struggles. I remember some time ago, a few years ago, when a young mother was facing the unimaginable pain of losing a baby. As a minister, I felt ill-equipped, powerless, to make a real difference in that situation. This was the kind of pain that I couldn't imagine. I couldn't set myself into that reality. What do I know about a loss so profoundly intimate and devastating? As a father, I really can't begin to imagine that kind of pain. But what I learned was, as the news spread, was that she wasn't alone. One by one, the stories began to be told. The communal grieving began. And I realized that it was my job to get out of the way and to let those with this common bond to minister to one another. 
We might say, no one has ever blended a family like I have, or no one's ever buried a father who meant so much, and no one has, has, has struggled with an addiction in the way that I have. No one can be helpful to me in my totally unique situation. But maybe that's not true. It's my strongly held belief that you are part of this little community of believers first because of God. Sure, you chose this church for your own carefully considered reasons. You like the music or the preaching or the, the coffee, back when we used to have, have coffee. You appreciate the Sunday school or the dinners or the people. But what if before you thought of any of those things, God was already aligning the cosmos, bringing you to just the right people at the right time in an unfathomable act of grace and mercy. I love hearing back from church members who are facing something in their lives and, and who report back to me, you'll never guess what happened, to which I think, actually, I bet I can, but go ahead, tell me anyway. Tell me all about the marvelous way that God has brought the right person to the right place at the right time, because in my experience, that's how faithful community works. And you see, that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I once heard it said that when you pray, coincidences happen. And when you don't pray, the coincidences stop. But of course, as followers of Jesus, we don't speak of coincidence. We speak of providence and call. Because God calls us into the pain of our brothers and sisters for his sake. But the story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane actually isn't one of those stories. Because as great as it is when God brings just the right man or woman of wisdom, it's not a prerequisite for finding the power of community. No matter what the qualifications of our community members, we are still better together. After all, no one in the garden that night could identify with anything that Jesus was going through. If Jesus has said to his friends, I'm just a little preoccupied tonight with the fact that I'm about to be arrested and falsely accused and deserted by my friends and beaten and flogged and crucified to overcome the power of sin and death in the world, no one would have said, been there, done that, <laughs> or I know what you're going through, or when that happened to me, here's how I got through. Because no one could understand what Jesus was going through. And yet, even so, he still longed for the presence and the prayers of his friends. One of the most sacred tasks of ministry is to have the opportunity to come before God to pray for people in their real lives. There are names in my prayer list that have been on that list for years, and I suspect they're going to be on there for a long time to come. It's going to take the long-haul approach. Some people are on my list for a couple of days. But I've come to see that God always answers prayers. Not always in the way that I think he should, or on the timeline that I have in mind. But no matter what, every prayer has an answer. And when we know that that is true, it changes your outlook on life. How? Well, you start to pray more. You create your own prayer list and you start to get a front row seat into the amazing things that God is doing. When I first started my ministry here at Selby Pastoral Charge, I had just graduated from Queen's University. And I came here with all kinds of wonderful, sophisticated pastoral care techniques, mostly based on Rogerian psychological principles. I'd been trained to listen deeply, to reflect back, to apply those psychological principles. But what I've learned seven years in is that what we need most, what people need most, is a whole lot more simple than that. People need presence, and they need prayer. Often when meeting with someone, they will say to me at the end of the meeting, well, that, that I feel so much better. I feel at peace with things. You made me feel so much better, to which I think, I'm glad. 
But it wasn't me, because all I did was listen and pray. We're going to have to give God the credit. Now, it would be foolish to think that, that, that giving someone your presence and your prayer is easy, because it's not, and we see that in our story this morning of the disciples being told to pray in the garden. They, they mess it up. It's not easy to enter into someone else's chaos, and it's hard to know what to say in prayer. But that is why Jesus is such good news. If ministry totally depended on me and my strength and my wisdom and my energy, we're all in trouble because I'm usually out of all three by Tuesday. But thank God, it's not about me. My job is to bring Jesus into the room and to get out of the way. When I arrive by the bedside or, or in a crisis, what will make the difference was that I showed up and that I invited God into the room. I have no magic words. My sage advice isn't that sage, <laughs> and my therapeutic treatments, well, not that great. All that I have is Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And what I've learned is that's always enough. But here's the thing. You don't need a master's of divinity degree to master presence and prayer. You don't need 20 years of experience in pastoral ministry either. One of the worst things that has happened in the Christian church is the professionalization of Christian care and witness. That's the minister's job, they say. What people need to know is that they're not alone and that someone cared enough to bring them and their problems before God. This morning, Jesus invited Peter, James, and John to accompany him, not because they have anything in particular to offer in this moment. They bring no ex expertise. They have no clinical knowledge. They have no tools to make Jesus' experience just a little bit easier. Jesus just knows one immutable truth, that life's joys and challenges are better faced together. That's what Jesus needed at Gethsemane that night. And that's what we need in our times of trial too. And that's the one thing that every single Christian in the room today can offer. So God in his amazing complicated, beautiful providence has woven you into a community. He wants you to invest deeply in this community, to, to care for one another, to bake for the bake sales, to serve on a committee, to set up for coffee hour, to help in the children's ministry, or whatever it is that you feel called and able to do. Now, it won't always be easy. It's going to take patience because the church takes patience and it's going to take humility. And you're going to get to practice your skills of forgiveness, trust me. But we do this church thing anyway. Knowing that in the midst of it that you will find against all odds in a lonely world torn apart by difference. That you've been mended together into the body of Christ. And... In a scary world, that makes all the difference because we are truly better together. Thanks be to God. Amen. Show hope can rise again.
taken up from the grave. Abide with me, abide with me. Don't let me fall, and don't let go. Walk with me, and never leave. Ever close, God abide. start. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, although we are blessed and truly grateful for Reverend Mike and his techie team that have been providing us with awesome, inspiring online services for one and a half years, and now have limited in-person services with live broadcasts, we look forward to returning to full in-person together with breakfast before Sunday school and church and social coffee time after the services, where we do not have to be masked and concerned about social distancing. Parents are not concerned about leaving youngsters in our nursery, where our midweek youth programs, business meetings, Bible studies, etc., are able to function normally again, and dinners are not a major concern, where we are not really embarrassed if we sneeze or cough in public, where we may plan our normal family gatherings without concerns about number of people and contamination. We may send our family to school or to work without these same fears. 
Your guidance in helping to control COVID and returning things to normal is really needed. Help us get back to this new norm sooner rather than later. Although we are in a fourth wave of COVID and emotions are very strong about what we should do and what we should not be forced to do, we pray you will guide all our thoughts and help cooler heads prevail. We are pleased to welcome the seven new members to our congregation today, as well as the six young adults that joined recently. Last Monday, we had a federal election with all its negativity and finger pointing. Was it necessary? Did we really need it? I don't know. That's behind us now. Help our elected members put the bad thoughts behind them and cooperatively get down to work for the things our country really needs. On Wednesday, we changed from summer to fall and started to receive much needed rain for dry wells and fields. We're grateful for this. Our congregations have many important meetings and decisions ahead. Please guide our thoughts and hearts throughout this. Some of our family and friends have health problems. You know who they are. Please guide the thoughts of the medical professionals to help solve these problems. Around the world, last Friday, Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou and the American officials came to an amicable agreement. She is now free and home in China after being held three years in Canada pending extradition to the USA. At the same time, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor were released after about three years captivity in China and are now home in Canada. What a wonderful end to this situation. We are grateful for this outcome. People are struggling with forest fires, earthquakes, volcanoes, hurricanes with associated floods, tornadoes, and other effects of global warming. New governments are taking away people's rights and freedoms. Refugees are being turned back at the borders. I bet these people do not have time to be concerned about COVID. We may have problems in Canada, but compared to others, you have truly blessed us. Lord, we're thankful for your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thanks, Sad. Well, as I said, God always answers our prayers, and Ed, your prayer has been answered. We're going to have coffee time following the service. Uh, outside today to celebrate our new members. There's cake and coffee, and if you're interested in joining us for that, we're just going to head out to the backyard and, uh, and enjoy that. So as I say, God answers prayers in amazing ways. Freely we have received and freely we give. It's now time for our offering. If you'd like to send your offering, you can do so as always by, by e-transfer or by joining our automatic banking option called PAR. And for those of you who are in the building, we have our container at the front and at the back. You can leave your offering there. And so I offer this simple blessing over all of these gifts that we have received in this time. These are the work of our hands and the love of our hearts. May they be a blessing to this community and the wider world in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as our worship time draws to a close, let's sing, I think what it has to be one of the, the, the most common, when, when you sing the song, someone will say to me at the door, this is my favorite hymn, and Vince and Andrea recorded it for us. It's Old Rugged Cross. Let's stand together and sing. On a hill far away stood an old no. rugged cross. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was saved. 
So I'll cherish the old rugged throne Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown Oh, that old rugged cross so despised by the world as a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear into dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my throne at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown to the old rugged cross I will ever be true it's shame and reproach let me bear He'll call me someday to my home far away, where His glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross. Well, I pray that our time together today has been a blessing to you. Just a couple of announcements before we head out the door this morning. Next Sunday, 9.20 a.m. at a.m., we're going to hope to have the fastest congregational meeting in history. We're going to break a land speed record uh, because we're, we need to approve the, the, the terms of uh, amalgamation for our two churches, MP Hill and Selby United Church. It's all laid out um, quite nicely. I don't think there's anything in there that's going to be controversial. If you'd like to pick up a copy of it, it's at the back, or I'm going to email it out this week with your your newsletter, uh, so you'll be able to see it one way or another. Uh, so 9.20 downstairs next week for a very short congregational meeting. Following today's service, as I say, we will be having a short time of coffee and cake and conversation, just a, a chance to welcome our, uh, our new members. It's kind of a trial balloon just to see if people are interested in having a coffee time following the service and if we can do it uh, in a convenient way outdoors. You will see in your, in your uh, bulletin just a short survey. You can drop those in the box at the back. Uh, for the folks at watching at home, you don't get a survey. We're having a, a session meeting on Tuesday. I just wanted some quick and dirty feedback from you folks on a couple of things, and I thought that'd be a really easy way to do it as we start to make some decisions for session this week. And next week, we're celebrating the Sacrament of Communion. For those of you at home, I welcome you to have some bread and juice on hand so that you can participate from your homes. And of course, we will cel celebrate that together next Sunday. So, looking forward to a God-filled week. Go now with God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Go now in peace. Amen.